All right, I'm Thad Glenn. I'm the Stevens County Extension Agent. And the reason we're here today is to learn a little bit about pest management in home gardens. Um, we are in what I would say our prime time of the year for our vegetable gardens. And at this point, I know that a lot of you folks are dealing with all different types of pests, whether it be uh, fungal diseases and insects. Um, I know I am in my, in my garden at home. So we're just gonna go over some quick, a kind of a, a relatively broad scope uh, overview of kind of some options and things to consider um, when trying to manage pests in the garden. So some of our learning objectives today, um, understanding, you know, weed control in a home garden, um, why we need to control weeds, you know, uh, prevention methods, um, and, 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 and why, well, we'll see why weeds are, are probably one of the worst pests in, in a garden scenario. Um, the basis of disease control in home gardens. Um, we will kind of go over the, the basic causes, you know, abiotic type natural or, or natural causes of, of, of things that cause issues in the garden, uh, fungal diseases, things like that. Um, and then some some insect control and uh, and how to how to you know control a lot of these insects you're seeing um, in the garden both preventatively uh, and and you know if it comes to it um, chemically. So what I what I like to I like to show this graph. I think it's very uh, indicative to not only a home garden situation but really in, in agriculture in general. It's kind of a dated graphic, 2005, but I would like to think that it's probably not too much different really now um, than if it was before, than it is here. Um, weeds are our number one pests in a, in a home garden situation. Um, why? Because they're continuously robbing our, our plants uh, that we're you know, trying to grow and produce food of nutrients, sunlight, and, and space, ultimately. The, those are the big three. Um, disease, or excuse me, insects would probably be our, our second. These, you know, depending on the year, are probably relatively equal. But insects are, can be uh, number two. That's, you know, foliage feed, feeding insects, um, root insects, um, stalk insects that are, you know, causing damage there. Um, disease, like I said, could probably be equal to this depending on the, the year and the weather. Um, and then other, uh, that could probably be your, that would be um, maybe like your nematodes and or abiotic type issues uh, as well. So controlling weeds, like I said, they compete with our desirable plants uh, for water, sunlight, and space. Um, you know, in this picture here, you know, you can see, it looks like they have a few rows of uh, beans or peas or something like that planted here uh, and then obviously some corn here on the on the, the left side and it just looks I mean it doesn't look aesthetically pleasing obviously um, you know this this looks like crabgrass or Johnson grass uh, is competing you know with with you know your crop that you're trying to grow so it also provides habitat for plant diseases this is something folks don't think about a lot um, a lot of our plant diseases will overwinter on weeds or in weed matter, um, whether it be li alive or dead. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, providing habitat for, for plant insect pests, another huge one. Um, you know, insects are, are a big deal in, in vegetable gardening and agricultural production anyway. Um, you throw in weeds and it's just somewhere else for those insects to, to hide. Uh, and, to, and to just to colonate and, and just to be while they're not feeding on your, on your, your garden plants. So obviously the, the, one of the biggest one is just to maintain a, a, visually, a, pleasing, uh, a visually pleasing garden um, you know, that, that you can easily walk around in and pick and, and, and enjoy. So prevention, um, my favorite is probably mulch. Um, of any sort, uh, straw, hay, uh, regular wood chip mulch, uh, 
there's a lot of different benefits of, of mulch in uh, in your garden. One would pro the, probably the biggest would be obviously cutting down on weeds around your plants, and also with an added bonus, helping conserve moisture uh, in your soil around those plants. Um, you know, especially with our soils we have around here, mostly clay type soils that we, you know, when you water them, you can tell the ground can only soak up so much when you're standing there watering it. Um, you know, putting a good mulch around there will help hold that moisture in place and, and, and allow um, it to kind of soak in over time as opposed to, to, to running off. Uh, weed fabric, this is, this is one that um, a lot of folks have a lot of different adaptations uh, of using. Can be somewhat of a pain in certain instances, can be good in other instances depending on how you, how you work with it. Um, there are certain weeds that if you get in your garden that can have no issue growing on or through uh, some of this, these weed fabrics, but nonetheless an option. Um, some of our thicker fabrics are, are really, really good at controlling weeds. Um, and, and you know, they have some of these pre-slit holes that you can plant, uh, plant into, or you can burn your own holes with like a propane torch. I know um, Dr. Bob Westerfield, he's, he does that uh, in, his, in his garden and he promotes it. And he said he, he has real good success with it. So. So just some more weed prevention. Uh, solarization, this is a really good option for those that are uh, organic uh, or, or trying to be more organic. Um, this is something that I would definitely recommend for any organic grower to be, to be doing uh, regularly. Um, yeah. Organics are, you're very limited when it comes to pesticide use. Um, so, you have to use these more, you have to use the sun's, the sun's heat. Uh, and you basically you're just using a piece of uh, white plastic and you're gonna cover up, um, you know, either a, an in, a bed or a certain portion of soil that the, the heat from the sun heats up the soil and will kill any, uh, you know, weed seed uh, and, and also an added bonus insect insects that have overwintered or, or in the soil, uh, as well as most fungal pathogens as well. So very beneficial um, to, to organic producers and a, and a needed uh, a tool in the toolbox. So cover crops, this is another thing that not only organic growers need to be taking advantage of, but a lot of obviously conventional type, um, you know, vegetable growers and, and and agriculture producers in general um, should be, you know, considering cover crops. Planting um, your crops in the fall, if you don't, most of us do not uh, winter garden as, as heavily as we do in the, in, the, in the spring and summer. So, you know, keeping in mind that, hey, well, I can plant, you know, wheat, clover, um, and have a, a bonus of building up our soils during that time of the year, as opposed to letting it lay uh, fallow. Um, the benefit there is that we build our soil organic matter up. We also hold the soil in place from you know, getting our, our rainfall that we typically get in the, in the winter. So, especially if we add in a, a, a plant like clover, um, it is a legume, meaning it, it fixes nitrogen. So, that nitrogen will be there at the beginning of the next growing season. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of benefits of cover crops. Um, you can also come straight back into your cover crop um, with minimal effort. You can come in and mow it down real, real low to the ground and use it as a natural mulch. Um, it's already in place. And then you can just uh, till your till your rows to, to plant, you know, if you want to plant tomatoes or peppers or squash, and you have a natural mulch. Um, so tons of different benefits for a little bit of extra effort uh, in a home, home garden situation. So something I definitely, definitely, definitely would recommend for, you know, your bigger, medium to bigger sized gardens or even a small garden really. Um, lots of benefits there. 
So emerge weeds, um, obviously the, the, the classic way would be hand pulling, hoeing, tilling, burning. Um, pros, you know, obviously does, does a lot, does a very good job of getting rid of existing weeds. Um, the cons, obviously very labor intensive. Uh, when you're out there plucking weeds or, or hoeing, you're never very, too very happy uh, to be out there in the hot sun hoeing weeds. So, um, and then, you know, the, the second one, or really, in my opinion, the first one, would, would be that, you know, you're constantly disturbing the soil. So if you're on a slope site um, or, or an area that, you know, is prone to run off, you know, that's, that's something to keep in mind. That's where your, your cover crops and your mulch really come in handy. You know, that's something to keep in mind. If you're, if you're dealing more with a slope site, the tillage aspect, you probably should skewer more towards um, your mulches and cover crop type, type situations to control weeds. Obviously, if you're going to cultivate, try not to get near the uh, roots of uh, desired uh, your desired plants. So, controlling emerged weeds, it's very important when we're using herbicides. Um, you know, some folks like to use herbicides, others don't. Uh, it doesn't ultimately really doesn't matter whether you you know do or don't. However you do that is up to you. But if you are going to use herbicides in your garden or around your garden. Make sure you're reading the label. Uh, really understand what, don't just go to the store and buy a product uh, and say, well, hey, this is gonna control all my weed problems. It could destroy your garden. Make sure you understand and read the label. Read, I mean, if you have questions, call your local extension agent, call me here in Stevens County, call your local extension agent, wherever county you are, because there's nothing worse than going out somewhere, and seeing someone's garden, they. They're like, well, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. And then you start asking questions. And then they won't tell you what they did until the very end. And they say, well, oh, I might have put this out. Okay, well, that was the problem. You, you sprayed Roundup over here and it drifted onto your tomato plants or whatever. So just be careful with herbicides uh, when you're using them. Um, proper weed ID is always an important aspect of, of weed control. Um, pre and post emergence herbicides, there are you know, your options for, for pre-emergent uh, pre herbicides in, gar in gardens um, that you can put down that are safe to use uh, around, you know, in, you have to put them out before the, the weeds emerge, um, but they are safe. Uh, Preen is a very common one um, that a lot of folks use. Um, Post, <clears throat> post emergence, we're very limited when it comes to post emergence herbicides in gardening just because of the diversity of the different crops that we're growing in a vegetable garden. Probably the most commonly used one around gardens or in gardens very, very, very carefully would be Roundup, uh, which is glyphosate. Um, keep it in mind that it will kill uh, any garden plant that it comes into contact with. So you have to very, very, very carefully uh, and specifically use Roundup, uh, you know, in certain instances um, when you can, uh, if you're going to use uh, herbicides. So uh, disease causes, we're going to move on to diseases. Um, so we more or less have about four different aspects of diseases or, or way, reasons that plants don't grow the way they should when it comes to disease and, and that would be mostly the majority of our of our issues are abiotic issues meaning they're not a um, a, a it is caused by something natural um, most of the time dealing with weather and or soil fertility issues. So I would say the number one is proper, improper soil fertility. That is the biggest uh, issue that we see uh, in home gardens and, and really in agricultural production in general is, is improper fertility. Um, do your due diligence, take your soil samples. That's something it's worth every penny uh, that you take in 
soil samples. Give them to your county extension agent, get them to come out and take your soil samples as soon as possible after the garden season's over. Um, during the garden season, there really isn't all too, too terribly much you can do when it comes to most of the time pH problems that we have here in our area. But in the fall, it's a great time to take soil samples. Why? Um, this, this is our pH scale, it goes from four to nine. Um, we try to get be right here in this, in this range from six to seven. Why? Because this is where the majority of our plant available nutrients uh, are the most available to plants. Um, this has to do with basically the, the uh, acidity in the soil, uh, mostly uh, metal ions, that will tie up a lot of our plant available nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, calcium, sulfur, magnesium. Uh, as we get further down on the low end, on this acid side, um, the, the less available those nutrients are. So our pH is probably our most limiting factor uh, here in, in Northeast Georgia and really in the Southeast uh, in general. So the bad thing is, is that we have to line to do that or to raise the pH up. However, it takes typically about six, six months minimum to raise the pH. So when we're called out to help somebody in a garden and you say, well, have you taken a soil sample in the last couple years? And they typically say no. So we take one and it will be a pH of about five, 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 four. And you say, mm, that ain't, that's not good. And they say, well, what can I do? I say, well, you can lime it as soon as you can, but it's, you're not going to see the effects until next year. So that's why I try to get folks to lime or, or to take samples towards the end of gardening season in the fall um, as soon as possible. Really, there's no bad time to take one. But as far as if you had to pick an ideal time to fall, um, you know, September or so, October uh, would be your ideal time. So enough of that. Uh, uh, sunlight, moisture stress, uh, lack of pollination, cold damage, all other causes of, of uh, why plants don't grow the way they should. Um, fungal diseases, very, very, I'm not going to say very common, but I would say common would be, uh, you know, how much we see of, of, you know, out here in the field. Foliar diseases, your, <coughs> excuse me, your leaf spots, um, your leaf blights, um, the, all the various things we deal with, foliar, um, rusts, uh, powdery mildew, downy mildew, tons of different foliar diseases. Um, I think diseases are very interesting, but you know, in the home garden, they can be, well, in agriculture production in general, they are very devastating. Nonetheless, very interesting uh, to me. Root and stem rots, fruit rots, um, Tons of different diseases that you know we get in, in uh, vegetable production, all caused by fungal pathogens. Uh, virus and bacterial diseases. I would say these are a little less common, as, uh, especially in you know smaller scale vegetable production. When we start getting in larger vegetable production, like we do down in you know South Georgia or uh, North Florida, um, we'll tend to see more viral, viral and bacterial diseases. Um, these are primarily bacterial wilts, uh, spots, and uh, vir and mosaic type viruses. And, you know, you'll see them occasionally. Um, actually, we had someone that had some tomato, uh, some tomato bacterial wilt this year uh, in their garden. And yeah, it's, when you get it, it's uh, no good. And really that area for tomatoes for the next, you know, two to three years is kind of shot. So um, that's typically brought in on material, uh, that, which is the issue there, because you bring in an infected plant or you have a plant that's infected, and a lot of this happens with seed. When people save seed, um, you know, they'll save the seed of a bacterial uh, wilt infected plant and then replant it the next year to get your transplants and then it just progresses from there. So just be careful um, when it comes to, 
to the bacterial wilt, especially in tomato um, around here. Nematodes, I would say pretty, pretty, you know, as far as around here, a little less common. Nematodes are really a problem in sandier type soils um, down in, you know, primarily South Georgia, South of Macon. Um, but, you know, occasionally we will see some nematode problems. Um, nematodes are essentially a microscopic roundworm that more or less just eat plant roots. Um, there's tons of different nematodes. Uh, the vast majority of them are non-harmful to plants, but you know, the few that are bad get, give nematodes a, a bad rap. Um, so those are our major, our major causes. So I would say that I tried to give you, give everybody a, a, a small sampling of, you know, what we primarily deal with uh, in home vegetables. Um, powdery and downy mildew, I would say this is probably one of the more common ones that we deal with. Uh, downy mildew uh, primarily produces some yellowing or yellow flecking on the leaves. Um, majority of your, the action or sporulation from the fungal disease will be on the underside of the leaf. Um, and not always, but primarily. Um, powdery mildew, that is primarily on the upper surface of the leaf. Um, it's usually kind of a white, it looks, I mean, really just like powdery, a powdery, like someone took uh, flour and just kind of scattered it on the, uh, the leaves of the plant. Um, very, uh, these are two, two of the most devastating diseases, uh, really, in, in, I mean, all types of agricultural production. Uh, with, with downy mildew being the one that's a little harder to control. Um, leaf twig and stem blights, uh, that would be primarily your things in like the Phytophthora family or Pythium family, um, typically associated with wetter soils. Not always, um, Phytophthora is, is more of a, uh, a wetter soil type disease, Pythium can stand kind of in the middle there. There's other, you know, stem blights as well. Um, more or less a lot of your, um, several of your, your leaf spot type diseases can cause twig and stem blights as well. Um, they can be kind of a doozy to, to identify and, and deal with. Um, like your early blight in tomatoes, that's something that everyone does, uh, deals with. Um, that's, that's a very, very common. Commonly, where the leaves of your tomato plant begin to turn yellow from the bottom up, and they have little little leaves, that's called, caused by an alternaria leaf spot. Um, and it will progress up the plant if you allow it. So, one little trick that I tend to tell, or I try to get people to do when they call and say, hey, I'm, I got the blight on my tomatoes, it's working its way up. What do I need to do? Number one, I'm gonna ask, well, have you pruned your tomato, your tomato uh, shoots uh, at least six to, six to eight inches once it becomes a larger plant? You need to prune those, those uh, stems off of that uh, main stem at least six to eight inches off the ground. You don't want any part of, that, of those, uh, those stems drooping or, and touching the ground because this is that's where this does that early blight uh, hangs out. It's a soil, uh, it hangs out in the soil and overwinters in the soil. So just keep your, your, your plants pruned up to about six to eight inches and in where none of them are drooping, the leaves are drooping near the ground. And that'll help a whole lot with, with early blight. So leaf spots, that's another, well, it's a very common, uh, Tons of different leaf spots. I mean, there's, I mean, you can name a ton of different leaf spots on all different species that we deal with in gardens. Um, that's probably like a Cercospora leaf spot on a, a pepper. Um, there's, I mean, you could talk about those for days. Very, very common on all different types of plants. Um, rusts, a little, I would say a little less common than opposed to you know that, that these guys, but we do see these, uh, you know, especially 
if you have like apples and things like that, you'll see cedar apple rust. Um, you may see them on like your, some beans, like I'm pretty sure this is a, some sort of bean. Uh, you'll see them from time to time. Uh, viral and bacterial diseases, uh, that would be these guys here, that would be your viral disease. Most of the time when we get viral type diseases, you get a bunch of sh what I call shoestringing or intervenal chlorosis or both at the same time where the leaves just look like they're dried up and they're just, they look real thin and they're kind of uh, shriveled up more or less. And then the, the, the veins of the leaf will be green while the, the plant and the, the leaves itself is starting to turn kind of a yellow. Um, you know, kind of a diagnostic there with viral disease. Um, nematodes, to, to really <clears throat> see if your plant's got nematodes, most of the time they look stunted um, and, and you can you know, pluck that plant up and, and examine the roots and typically you can see where the nematodes have laid eggs on the, uh, on the roots of the plant. Uh, like I said, most of the time up here in our area, not quite as big of an issue. Most of our stuff is our root rot type diseases when it comes to when we have a whole plant uh, dying. So, uh, Disease prevention, like I said, take your soil test, do your due diligence there. I feel like I beat that in the head pretty good. Uh, but just take your soil samples. Uh, it, it's, worth, it's worth the money to do that. Uh, ensure your garden area receives at least six to eight hours of sunlight and follow, follow your planning recommendations for your area. Um, the sunlight is a very, very big thing, especially with drying of foliage uh, from dew or uh, if you have to water over the top, which a lot of us don't have drip irrigation or, or something like that. Just allow that foliage to, to dry up uh, before it gets dark because that's when the majority of our, uh, our fungal pathogens spread. When we have extended hours of, of moisture on the leaf. So just keep that in mind. Uh, proper water management, very, very important. Um, don't, you don't want to overwater and you don't want to plant areas that, that stay overly moist for long periods of time. This is a, just a breeding or a, just a, a, a big chance if you're going to be dealing with root rot type diseases um, in, your, in your garden. So shoot for moist but not overly saturated soils. Uh, like I said, if possible, if you know you're gonna have a garden permanently here for a long period of time, spending some money on drip irrigation is something to consider because like I said, that wetting of foliage continuously, uh, especially when we're working and we get home at you know, five, six o'clock in the at night and we have to water the garden and then it's wet all night. And then, you know, the next day or the other two days down the road, you go out there to water it, you, you got powdery mildew. Uh, you know, it's just that extended leaf wetness that we're dealing with. Uh, water in the morning if possible. I know that's not always applicable, uh, but just try to water in the morning uh, if, if you can. So crop rotation. These these are what I would say the essentials if you want to be an organic uh, producer. Uh, these type of prevention, well, and the previous slide. Uh, crop rotation, that, this would be uh, a huge one. Don't plant vegetables in the same family in the same area every year. <clears throat> so, you know, call your county extension agent or, you know, Google it or whatever. Um, but basically, you got your groups or your your different species of plants that are in the, in the same family, and we don't want to like cantaloupe, cucumbers, honeydew, melons, pumpkin, squash, watermelon. Those are all in the cucurbit family, so we wouldn't want to plant uh, you know squash and a squash in, in an area one year, and then the next year plant cantaloupes. You might get away with it for one or two years doing that until your pest pressure is going to build up. You're going to start dealing with vine borers and, and various different fungal diseases because you've planted, you've planted uh, cucurbits in that area for 
three, four, five years. So just rotate where you're planting uh, these, these crops around in your garden, even in a small garden. Uh, because obviously when you're dealing with a smaller area, you really have to be careful with that. If you're, you know, if you're planting tomatoes in the same place every year, I mean, you could lose, you know, a good portion of your garden that you can't plant tomatoes in for three, four, or five years. Uh, so, just keep that in mind when you're planting a garden every year. You're planting it, not planting it, but planting it out. Uh, you know, take some time to really remember what you planted there, or write it down pre, you know, from the, have it written down from the previous year. To, uh, to remember. Um, sanitation after harvest. Uh, make sure you're removing the plants and plant residue. Uh, a lot of our diseases and insects like to overwinter on our, uh, our dead or dying plant residue. I know it's easy to just leave, uh, you know, hey, that those pepper plants are, are done. It, they just got hit by our last frost, or the first frost, and we're just, you know, hey, it's fall and I'm done with the garden. And it's a lot easy just to let them, just say, leave them out there or whatever. But as they're sitting there, they're collecting fungal, because they're starting to die, they're starting to go downhill, you know? And they're collecting more or less, they're just a huge reservoir for disease, because plants that are dying are a, very easy target for especially fungal diseases and and uh, insects to just hey this is a good place to hang out this is a good place to be so as soon as you're done with them and you know that you're hey I'm through with this plant for the year or this group of plants get them out of there take them away from the garden get rid of them burn them be done with them um, and then you know do what you want to do for the fall whether it's a cover crop or you know a fall garden so. Another one that I see a, a fair amount of is not selecting quality plants or seed. Um, when you're buying seed, make sure you do some research. Make sure you're buying seed from a reputable um, business or, or dealer uh, as much as possible. <clears throat> you know, if you're buying it from a local farm supply store, you know, just say, hey, look, where did y'all buy this seed from? You know, are they, a, you know, more than likely they're a reputable dealer if they're selling it from a farm supply store. Um, but just, you know, do your due diligence, especially if you're ordering online. Um, that, the, there's a lot of people that get took uh, online. So uh, when you're buying transplants, really inspect your transplants. That goes for anything, whether it's flowers, uh, you know, trees, transplant trees, uh, tomato transplants pepper transplants, it don't matter what they are. Inspect the plant, make sure it's a healthy plant when you're buying it, uh, because if you take home a, a plant that's not healthy, you're probably gonna deal with problems uh, pretty, pretty quickly uh, soon after planting. And then you might transfer something into your garden. Um, you know, aphids are a, are a big one that we transfer into gardens a lot from transplants because people go to Home Depot or their farm supply store, they say, hey, I'm gonna plant a garden and pluck one up and throw it in the truck and they get home and plant it and the next thing you know, they got an aphid invasion in their garden because of that one or two plants they bought. So just look under the leaves, do a little investigation and then go about your way. So uh, disease control. Um, this is our, what I say, our last leg of, of what we need to do. Uh, to, you know, if all else fails, uh, fungicides, you know, we, we use a lot of fungicides um, without doing the other things first. And we're putting a, a band-aid on a, or on a, on a cut that needs stitches. So let's do the preventative stuff we've just spoken about um, down, you know, and give it its due diligence before we just go straight to fungicides. Um, nonetheless, there are a lot of good products. Um, Daconil, <clears throat> Daconil is probably one of our most commonly used products uh, in, in home gardens. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a very, very good fungicide, very uh, broad spectrum, good fungicide. Mancazeb is another one that, that's very commonly used. Uh, on the organic side, we have uh, liquid copper, uh, and sulfur, 
both of which you need to be very careful with um, because of phototoxicity issues, meaning as we get warmer in the summer, like we're as basically right now, I would, I would probably be very uh, wary of using copper and, and sulfur type products on home vegetables just because it gets so hot and when we get so hot and we're spraying these these materials uh, it can tend to to burn uh, the leaves of some of your vegetables so if you're or, if you're trying to be organic and and this is where those prevention methods come in um, you know come into play uh, at this point in the year so low rates of this uh, at this point in the year um, Keep in mind these are these are applied in a preventative manner. Um, they're not going to have a curative effect. It's not going to make the leaf spot go away. It's not going to make uh, you know. It, it's not going to cure it. It's not going to make it go back to the way it was before. So the key is is make sure you're paying attention. Look, check your garden. You know every day and walk over it. Just make sure. You're not dealing with any fungal diseases or anything because the sooner you can get these products out to protect uh, to protect your plants or if you know you've dealt with this okay I've had powdery mildew on my squash every year for the last two years in June at this date around this date well you probably should just go ahead and start putting out a fungicide product you know the week before that way you, your plants don't even have to deal with that. So just keep that in mind. Just do your due diligence and, and pay attention uh, and try to put these out uh, in a preventative manner or as soon as you see disease. Um, what product uh, to use is determined by the disease you're attempting to control and, uh, and the crop that it's on. So yeah, like I said, feel free to call your county extension agent um, we're pretty pretty good at most of the time off the top being able to, to give you a product to use uh, that's really rel relatively available uh, to to you so give us a call so we'll swap over to insects um, some of these guys and they these they can defoliate your stuff really really quickly um, we got the true bugs, meaning a true bug or insect. People that are in entomology, uh, they get upset when you call a, an insect a bug. But they, I call it the true bug group, meaning they have six legs. Um, they, they are mostly uh, foliar feeders, not always, but mostly foliar feeders. Uh, that right there would be a, a leaf-footed bug see them a lot on really just about any garden uh, garden uh, crop. Butterflies and moth larvae, um, that would be your, your hornworm there that he grows into a big, big old uh, moth. Um, bad on tomatoes, the tomato hornworm. Actually, just, I was over at my neighbor's and we were looking at his tomatoes and he had one that he didn't even see. I was like, Right there, there he is, and he, he was like, I was wondering what was eating him up. And uh, so we used him as fishing bait. So it worked out well, but they will defoliate your plants very, very, very quickly if you're not paying attention. So scouting for these guys on tomatoes is, is, is vital. Um, and another thing I should have mentioned, Japanese beetles right now are out in force, um, and I'm gonna have to deal with those. Um, Probably today or tomorrow. I was trying to wait to see if they would move on, but they're not. They are uh, they're tearing my my pole beans up right now. So true flies. Uh, that would be like your sawfly larvae that you see here. Um, these are a real huge problem in um, roses. I know that we're not talking about roses, but I've seen these guys completely defoliate. Uh, they call them pear slugs, but really it's a sawfly larvae. I've seen them completely defoliate a rose uh, in a matter of about a week. And then the folks call you and say, well, what's wrong? It's too late. Um, you know, they, <laughs> you gotta, when, you, when you're dealing with these or really any foliar feeder, 
Uh, that's a worm. You got to get them early. So, um, beetles, all different sorts of beetles that we deal with. Japanese beetles, like I like I mentioned, um, that would be that. I'm pretty sure this is a a bean beetle. Um, pretty sure those are pretty common too. Um, these guys kind of look like a ladybug, but they're I think they're 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 a imitation ladybug because they they don't they don't want to get killed, but Really, they just eat your eat your stuff all up. Uh, thrips. These guys are. This picture is really kind of really big, but um, thrips are microscopic. They're very 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 small. Uh, most of the time, when you're dealing with thrips, they're going to be in the flower. They like that uh, that real tender flesh in the flower. And uh, if you're dealing with these, you can. Bring me a, a sample, and I can look under the microscope and, and, and see them most of the time. Aphids, probably one of the most common garden um, insects that we deal with. Um, very easy to control. That's the, the good thing about aphids. There, spider mites. Um, they're doozy. Spider mites and thrips are doozies in vegetable production. These guys can be kind of di very difficult to control. Um, depending on the situation. There's not a ton of really good insecticides um, for these and they can get resistant um, very quickly uh, because they, they reproduce so, so quickly. So, Pest prevention, uh, we're always focusing on prevention here as opposed to just spraying an insecticide. Um, so obviously we've talked about crop rotation, solarization, uh, proper soil fertility, all these things are big when it comes to, if you have a healthy plant, it's going to have a better chance of being able to withstand a little insect damage before we, we take care of it. Um, plant as early as possible. Um, this is always a hot topic, you know, when's the last freeze going to be, when's the last uh, freeze going to be, you know, and this year we had a really late freeze in May, um, and I know some people got hit pretty hard by it. Um, I got lucky. It was only 33 degrees in my house and I already had my garden planted. And uh, that would have been ironic if an extension agent's garden would have gotten hit by a freeze uh, when he, you know, tells people to make sure they plant at the right time. But, um, so this, I needed to update this calendar. It needs to be a little further back. Um, I like to say our, our last frost date, and I say average last frost date, uh, here in Stevens County is probably around the second or second to third week of April. Um, if you want to be even more on the safe side, probably the third week of April would be a better estimate. A lot of people wait until after Mother's Day, um, which is you know perfectly fine. Uh, you know if you're if you're very superstitious on planning, um, but you know, I like that second to third week of, of April most of the time, on average. So that's not saying, you, you know, we can't, you know, freeze in May like we did this year. Uh, just the idea of that is, is most of our pest pressure is worse as the summer goes on. Uh, all of our insects hatch and the warmer it gets, the more insects we're dealing with uh, as the summer goes on. So if we can get our our vegetables planted a little earlier and have them producing earlier, we can avoid both of those clashing at the same time. A big insect pressure and our vegetables trying to flower and, and, and fruit uh, at the same time. So that's kind of the idea uh, there. So just a few more things that are a little um, more, a little, a little more different other than just basic prevention. Uh, diversified planting. This takes a little work, um, but it's been shown that you can reduce insect losses if you don't put all your plants in the same location. So, I, you know, this is a cool picture here. Uh, it looks like, you know, they got a couple rows of corn here, two rows of corn, and then they got uh, two rows of some, that looks like some peas or beans, or, or and then this is some sort of peas and beans, and then two rows of corn here, and then they probably have peas and beans on that side. 
So the idea is, I mean, ultimately, make the insects work a little harder to spread in your garden. Um, you know, so if you're willing to, to put forth that type of effort, there has been some benefit um, seen there uh, in doing that. Uh, companion planting, uh, purposely, that's purposely planting uh, different crops in proximity of it, in each other to increase productivity. Um, there are certain plants that like to be planted next to other plants in a vegetable garden, and there are some that don't like to be planted next to each other. Um, I guess that's just why the good Lord, he made them like that. But um, you can't, that's something that organic folks can definitely take advantage of there. Um, you know, even conventional as well, um, to just, basically they have these uh, companion vegetable charts you can get online uh, and just, or call, call us, I'm sure we have them too as well, and uh, just check and see what likes to be planted near where, near what to, to hopefully uh, increase the productivity a little bit. Uh, trap crops, uh, this is uh, something I personally like to do and I like actually what's in this picture here. I like marigolds a lot. I, well, they're pretty, number one. They attract, um, they attract pollinators, which is good, and then they also uh, attract beneficial insects. So the, the idea with trap crops is to attract pests away from the main crop that you're planting. Um, to hopefully kind of concentrate the, the bad pest insects over here away from what you're planting. Um, you know, beneficial type plantings are always good as well. Uh, all different type pollinator type plants. Um, we have, uh, you know, cone flowers, uh, marigolds, anything like that, any type of, your, you know, annual or perennial type pollinator flower, always a good thing to have around. Pollinators, uh, pollinator uh, plants tend to attract beneficial insects that control your pest insects as well. So you get the pollinator benefit and you get the beneficial <coughs> insect uh, aspect of it as well. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're planting. A lot of people plant sunflowers. People like to, to attract to, to trap crop with, um, especially in like corn and things like that. So, lastly, but not leastly, um, you know, we do have to mention um, insecticides. So, tons of different insecticides out there. <clears throat> Majority of them are pyrethroid insecticides, meaning um, they do, they kill really on contact uh, or when the insect comes in contact or soon after. <clears throat> Tons of different ones out there. Carbaryl, that would be your seven dust that you see uh, regularly on you know shelves at the garden center. Great product. Not the cure for everything though. Um, if you have a leaf spot, seven dust is not your is not your solution. You need to be putting out a fungicide, not an, an insecticide. So um, a good product, but not the solution for everything in the garden. Um, Malathion, a little bit. Uh, a product that's a little bit less broad spectrum than uh, uh, seven dust, but a good product. Um, Permethrin, there's tons of different different uh, ones. Silohatrin, metacloprid, um, that one's a little, if you need to be careful with that one, pollinators, uh, that one's real bad on bees. Uh, you just gotta be careful when you spray that type product. Um, make sure you're, um, Organic, you got BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. Good product to use on caterpillar type insects if you're dealing with those. Uh, it's an organic product. Conventional folks use it all the time as well. Um, pyrethrins, uh, that's just a natural uh, product that is uh, derived from <clears throat> the pyrethrum flower. And it's more of a... Uh, as a, as a preventative type product. Uh, Spensonad, it's real good on uh, caterpillar type insects as well. 
a neem oil and insecticidal soap. Those are what, uh, what I would be contact insecticides, uh, meaning they have to come in direct contact when you're spraying them to, to kill those insects. Your oils would be for like your aphids, uh, mites, uh, spider mites, thrips, things like that. Uh, the, the soaps are kind of on the same level, uh, but they have to come in direct contact uh, with those with those insects. Uh, let's see. What product you use? Like I said, with the with the you know, herbicides, <clears throat> it's determined on you know what crop it's in. Um, proper we, uh, insect ID is critical. So bring us in a sample if you have questions or. Or you can shoot us an email with a picture of an insect if you have any. If you don't know what it is, just give us. Uh, we're happy to help. So give us a call or, or shoot us an email. Um, and always apply insecticides late in the day when pollinator activity is decreased. So <clears throat> that's something that I take very seriously. I try not to, in my personal garden, and I try to promote it to everybody else. Try not to, you know. Do your due diligence, and I mean, pollinators are important. Um, you know, without pollinators, we don't have food. Uh, so let's keep that in mind when we're using these products. Um, and and like I said earlier, promote products if you, or promote excuse me pollinators if you can uh, as much as possible. Um, without them, we don't have food, and and. They're essential to the success of more than 90% of the plants on our planet. 90%. Um, so, two, 200, over 250,000 plants uh, need to have pollinators to flower and fruit. So, I mean, keep that in mind. Um, you know, planting a wide variety of nectar and pollen rich plants with, in all different colors will attract all different types of pollinators. Uh, it'll, and honestly, it'll help boost your garden production. Uh, more than, you know, more than, if you took just a little bit of that space that you could use to put five or six more pepper plants or a couple extra tomato plants and plant you some pollinator plants, you'd be surprised how much it would cut down on your, your insect pressure uh, and, and it'll also boost your, your crop load uh, as well on your, on your plants. So that's all I have for y'all today. Um, Thank you all for your attention, and, and I hope you've learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at any time. This is my contact info here, uh, tglenn93 at uga.edu, and our office number is 706-779-5501. Uh, if you have any questions on the live, you can feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll try to get them answered or put your contact info on there and I can give you a call or give me a call. So either way, thanks for being here today and um, hope you can join us next week. We have another program next Thursday. I believe it's, it's either pest management at home, turf grass or lawns, I believe. Should be a good one. We're dealing with a lot of uh, turf grass diseases and, and insects right now um, and I know everybody wants to have a nice lawn, so thank y'all for being here today, and have a good day.